Zenith is a 2018 novel written by debut author Sasha Alsberg and established author Lindsay Cummings. It's a space opera romance, notable mainly for Sasha Alsberg is the second most subscribed booktuber, and the book debuted number 7 on the New York Times YA bestseller list for one week. For most people, that's where the story ends. It's not a book that had much momentum as the year went on. But maybe you're an inquisitive bugger, and wondered if anyone had thoughts about this YouTuber's book. So you look up reviews on Amazon, Goodreads, YouTube, and then... Oh no. Oh no. Oh no! Why? Why? What a dumpster fire. I mean, full on dumpster fire. This went wrong in just about every area that exists. I don't know what happened here. Did this book not even get edited? Who's to blame for this? Whose fault is this? This is the flimsiest sci-fi I've encountered. It's laughable. Vengeance will be mine. Hope is a raging asshole. God, I miss that time in our society when hard work could get you places instead of working hard to be famous first. <laughs> what the hell? Everybody who had anything to do with this f***ing book and thought that this this depiction of PTSD was okay should be f***ing ashamed of themselves. Fuuuuck! Chapter 1. What the hell is booktube? Booktube is a genre of YouTube videos focused around books, ranging from reviews, discussions, sketches, and drama. Ugh. Basically like the beauty community with their own personalities and lingo, but it's books over makeup. And even though I would count as a booktuber, I even have it in my Twitter profile. Follow me. I didn't know they even existed till three years ago. I consumed different content back then, where I boldly claim in my first review that no one was making videos about books in 2013. I was an idiot. But even after, I'm not the biggest fan of booktube. Boo. It's nothing personal, I just don't find the format that engaging. Once you see one TBR, you've basically seen it all. It's not my cup of tea with the way I tackle videos. Could you imagine if I tried to be your traditional booktuber? Hey bookworms, welcome to my channel, Bookworm Review! Today, it's a special day, cause it's my TBR! Yeah! Look at all the books I'm going to read! Ooh. Ah! Oh! I'm so quirky! <sighs> Thank you for watching! I'll see you in three weeks for the exact same kind of video! And don't forget to hit that like and subscribe! Yeah! Ooh. Ah! Then there's the drama. Just doing a cursory search of booktube, you will quickly find a cavalcade of yikes of all kinds, from issues of racism, clicks, frustrations with the community, that time they invited white booktubers to the set of The Hate You Give, that time someone painted the cover of Carve the Mark on their arm and got called out about promoting self-harm, that time a guy made a tasteless joke about women creators and makeup, that time that photo was taken, and whatever happened two months ago, cause I can't keep up with this stuff even if I tried. The only thing faster than the speed of sound is booktube drama. And at the beginning of 2018, the hot tea everyone was spilling was their reviews of Zenith. Mmm. Scalding. The word was in. Zenith is bad. Terrible. Shoddy. Inferior. Inadequate. Offensive. Problematic. Awful. Lousy. A blight on YA. And utter garbage. It was so poorly received that it got 3.12 stars on Goodreads. <gasps> 3.12 stars on Goodreads? That's like a 95 on Metacritic. 
Your job is to rate movies on a scale from good to excellent. What if I don't like them? That's what good's for. Ha! 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 Seriously, Goodreads is trash. Turns out combining Facebook, Wikipedia, and Rotten Tomatoes is a terrible idea. But what would you expect from the site that awarded Best Horror Novel to Stephen King's non-horror novel? Goodreads is garbage, but you should follow me, y'all. And I stumbled into all of this. I was never supposed to know about this book. The only reason I own a copy of this, darling, is because one of my fellow creators told me about it after seeing the authors on their book tour. I decided to check them out because why not? I've never done a book tour before, and maybe I can network. Boy, did I feel out of place. Turns out late 20s bearded weirdos aren't their main demographic. It didn't help I got nervous and froze up talking with the authors, leading to this awkward picture. Oh my god, I am so red, what the hell were you thinking? But that's how I got the book, so thanks Daniel, now I'm making this video. Ugh. Chapter 2, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. I will say, Zenith's cover is one of my favorites. The way the purple and blue galaxies blend into each other, the holographic silver symbol, what can I say, vibrant colors are my aesthetic. Going across the spine and ah sh**. Hello darkness my old friend. They had the book published through Harley Quinn. To be more specific, the Harley Quinn teen line. I've talked about them before, they're famous for all those cheesy romance books, basically owning a huge part of the market with their many imprints. They know their demographic and cater to it in force. But from my experience, you can't expect anything good to come from them. What would I expect from a company about to release 1, 2, 3, 4, 142 books in May alone? That's not even including the box sets. Quality over quantity, what can I say? I can't wait to read such titles as Down and Dirty, BOSS, in all caps. And by caps I mean peen falling for the cowboy dad. Oh good, the straight rope back mountain. Rescued by the single dad. Wait, aren't these the same dad? Could her courageous but scared rescuer and his adorable three-year-old help heal Charlie's lonely heart? It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Wait. When did they start writing about the gays? Oh no. Oh no! Game changer! Is that even human? <laughs> Saddle up. He keeps his past very deep and his emotions very deeper. Shifts and fuck yes! I kind of want to read these. For research, I gotta know what happens at attention. And by attention, I mean penis. But yeah, the second I saw this little guy, I knew I needed to adjust my expectations. But you know how the saying goes, don't judge a book by its cover. Or publisher. I mean, most YouTubers first books aren't good to begin with, but maybe it will be entertaining. Endless darkness. Oh. Chapter 3. Finally talking about Zenith. In the Maribel Galaxy, on the USS Badass Bitches, we meet Androma, nicknamed Andy, but the rest of the universe knows her as the Bloody Baroness. With her loyal crew of diverse characters, these deadly pirates pillage the galaxy, leaving few alive. A fight with the Baroness is a meeting with death itself. But when she's not killing, she broods about the killings. Insert Linkin Park music here. Each line she etched into the metal was another life cut off. Another heart stopped with a slice of her blades. A hundred lives to cover up the pain of the very first. A hundred more to shovel away the hurt into a place that was dark and deep. See, she's a complicated protagonist. Even killers like her still had souls. And she knew that everyone deserved to be mourned by someone no matter the crimes. Crawling in my skin. All that changes for our elusive anti-hero when her home planet's army attacks her ship. 
which is not new being the most wanted pirate, but her crew is usually able to evade them. This is different though. The ships move like Andy would, knowing her every move, but no one would know that except... But he's dead, right? For the first time, Andy's ship has been captured by Dex, her ex-lover. But it turns out Dex captured her for a mission by her planet's leader, General Cortez, where we get filled in on Andy's backstory. A personal bodyguard to the General's daughter Kaylee, but was branded a traitor when a freak ship accident killed her. Andy escapes to join up with Dex as bounty hunters, and soon lovers, only for him to try to turn her in, but she ran off nearly killing him and became the Bloody Baroness. But now, the General needs her help. It turns out his son, Valen Cortez, went missing two years ago and is being held captive on the moon prison near Zen Fetira, a dying planet that lost in a big war in the stars, but they don't know why they have him. There haven't been any ransom demands, no responses to our inquiries. I would have stormed their planet when he was first taken, but we couldn't risk upsetting the peace treaty between our part of the galaxy and theirs. Ten years still remain until the treaty ends. So now he's using Andy and her crew as some sort of suicide squad, which if successful, your slate could be wiped clean if, and only if, you bring my son back to me, alive. You could return to Arcadius, Androma. Home, Andy's mind whispered. There is one catch, though. In order to make sure she doesn't turn tail at the first chance, she will have to work with her ex. The hell I am! Dex leapt to his feet. But Dex has no choice if he wants to regain his status as a legal bounty hunter again after losing Andy the first time. So off they are, but Queen Noor of the dying Zen Fetira is about to unleash a new era of darkness and change the galaxy as we know it. For years, the suffering of her people, her planet, had torn her apart. But she knew deep in her soul that soon she would have the power to stop it all. Chapter 4 So is Zenith bad? Yes? I mean, it has some serious flaws. For example, the first 50 pages or so are just an absolute mess on structure. Starting with a prologue about Valen in prison, then we get introduced to Andy and her crew with exposition paragraphs for each, then to ruin the flow, we jump to another character named Claren, talking about things like conduits and yieldings, and I guess this is happening in the past. Then we jump to Dex, which, girl, I'm only 22 pages in and have no foundation for seven characters that all come off as tropes and cliches. That's asking a lot from your readers to engage with. I can't blame anyone reading the first 50 pages and feel they aren't wasting their time with a book that's basically an embodiment of everything people hate about YA. I've also heard there are a lot of other similarities with works like Six of Crows and Throne of Glass, but I can't really comment because I've never read them. Though this has been a common complaint of modern YA to capitalize on whatever is popular. We saw it with Paranormal Romance, then Dystopia, so seeing this here doesn't surprise me. Anyway, the problem with a book isn't because the story is cliched. You'll find when you consume a lot of media that a lot of stories use them. I mean, just to compare, the first Star Wars is as cliched as a story can come. If you don't believe me, look up Pauline Bitch Please Kale's review of A New Hope cause it's a trip. But the reason A New Hope works is in how it executes that story. That's what really makes or breaks a work. You can have the most tired concepts, cardboard characters, cliche after cliche, but it can work if you have good execution. Originality is not the key to success. It can only go so far, but fail in that execution and you won't be able to engage your audience no matter how original it is. And that's where Xena fails the most. Remove all the ways the story is conveyed 
and look at its basic elements, you can see there is a solid vision. It just didn't tell it well. But after you get past those first 50 pages, you discover the book is not that bad. Oh, it's still flawed. Like how the second act starts with the ship's engines failing, causing it to crash. You think something malicious was behind it, but nope. The crash just happened to take us to Andy's pilot's home planet so her subplot could happen. Boy, ain't that just convenient. I actually do like the character development that happens here, but regardless, contrived writing is contrived, and that's how poor execution can even undermine the good parts. Zenith is bad, but it's about on par with the Star Wars prequels. Nothing bad, nothing great, just subpar. That's the hot tea everyone was spilling? Cause someone wrote a generic book? That tea's not hot. It's not even cold. This isn't even tea. It's milk. Oh God, it's milk. I get having issues with the book, but some of these critiques come off as Chapter five, Raging Asshole. Seriously, the book is flawed, but some of the points others raise really don't hold water. For example, Valen's character is said to be inconsistent cause at first he wants to kill Andy, vengeance will be mine and all that, but after being rescued, he forgives her pretty quickly, only to big twists and go vengeance will be mine again. Hey, that's poor characterization. No one can change that fast, and you would be right. If it didn't turn out, he was lying cause he knew big twist before getting rescued and lied to make sure he can do said big twist. It's not like the book literally states that. Oops. When talking about bad media, people will prop up a particularly memorable line to showcase the badness on display. It's, you tear me apart, Lisa. That's a good movie, An Inconvenient Truth, or, oh my god. The common one here is, hope is a raging asshole. Cause hope is a raging asshole? What does that even mean? I'm so glad we could have a shared experience over this ridiculous line that was intended to be silly. So, in the book, Andy's crew are waiting for Dex and Andy to come back from the moon prison. They are well past schedule and don't know if they should leave or stay with the threat of being caught. With nothing else, Lyra says, <clears throat> Hope is all we have. Hope is a raging asshole, Gilly said. Explain to me, Gilly, Brex said with a sigh. How exactly can an asshole rage? Lyra choked on a sudden, unexpected laugh. I swear, the two of you, you were both born with my brother's sarcastic soul. Hope, Hope is, a, is raging a raging asshole? asshole? What does, what that, does that, that even mean? mean? I'm, so I'm so glad, glad we could have, have a shared, shared experience. It's not like there aren't better, sillier examples. Like how after a bar fight, there's a random character saying, my leg, my leg. And since I have the privilege of being under 30, my brain immediately goes for it, insert Spongebob reference here. And there are moments of bad writing, like the book's issue with making a statement, then needing to repeat it, but with a creative flair in the same sentence. The metal walls dented at random, as if bodies have been thrown against them, leaving their mark. A flash of light blinded them, as part of the Marauder's metal shielding actually fell away from the viewport, like a piece of flaking skin. Ew. He was drawing something in the wet mud, on the bank of the stream, his hands moving effortlessly, as if the stick were a paintbrush, the mud a fresh canvas. No shit. But that's the easy nitpicky stuff. But then you get to the problematic stuff. Let's just jump into it. 
There's the time Dex gives Andy a non-consensual kiss, which is bad, but doesn't hold weight in context since Dex did it to get Andy to start a brawl, cause getting his ex who literally stabbed him in the heart mad looks authentic, only to backfire when Andy and the girls reveal their own plan. It's a scene meant to show their Spencer Tracy Catherine Hepburn chemistry played for laughs and that they still have feelings for each other. Her pulse heightened at his nearness, and for a moment, things between them felt like they used to. But then you get to the rape scene. Mm. The issue with using rape in fiction is it's a difficult subject to approach and can come off as a lazy device at the expense of predominantly female characters. This topic has been covered in depth for years and you have to be dumb to try to defend it. However... No. However, no. However, no. However, the big twist is Valen is the stepbrother of Nor, cause Nor's mother, Claren, during the Great Space War, gave herself over to General Cortez, revealing she has hypnotic mind powers that she uses to seduce him against his will for reasons. Birthing Valen. She then commands Cortez to take them back home, but he overcomes her power, takes Valen, then under the guise of a ceasefire, bombards her home planet while slitting her throat as she watches Jesus Christ the f With her dying breath, she telepathically tells Nor about her stepbrother, leading her to capture and torture Valen to awaken his powers and learn his origins, to then go Manchurian candidate on good old dad using the confusion to let Nor invade and shoot people with her special mind control drug called Xena. Oh, hey, it's the title to this whole thing. Most people argue about this scene for its existence and it isn't given much time outside of an exposition dump at the end. The reason I'm not going gung-ho over this is one, we don't have the full picture. On the back of the book, we have the tagline, there is darkness sweeping across the stars. But we don't see that darkness at all here. Throughout Clarence's chapters, we get hints to a plan that would upset the Order. A plan that clearly requires a child from the dark planet and light planet, but whatever that is, is being held for the second book. My guess is it either relates to this area called the Void, or the black hole at the center of everything. Or both, it's clearly something about darkness taking the light that, at best, is a form of world building to a bigger message, or at worst, a convoluted Machiavellian plan to have Valen kill his father. Which, even when you compare it to examples like Avengers 200 having Carol Danvers give birth to her literal rapist, and treats it as romantic, or Flowers in the Attic's rape scene where the victim says she was asking for it, or just the million things with Fifty Shades, um, Goblin Slayer? Sure, they could have given more detail to the effects of the rape, though bombing a planet is a pretty clear sign. But it's hard for me to get upset over what is, in the end of the day, a soap opera twist committed by two awful people. Really, the only problematic issue I can't defend is Andy's portrayal of PTSD that comes off as shallow, cliched edginess the authors turn on and off like a light switch for a dramatic effect that could have been expressed better. However... No. Chapter 6. Can You Forgive Me? Andy is shallow. I know. Her PTSD? Pretty bad. But I want to talk about what the authors try to do with her, because I think it's worth discussing. She once lived a life of luxury, only to have it all taken away over a situation she had full control over. It was her job to keep Kaylee safe, but she really wanted to go on that ride for her birthday. It's against her better judgment, but she's a good friend, and what's the worst that can happen? You could have stopped this. You had control. And yet here you are. Alive. 
How dare you? How dare you? You had one job and you failed, but why are you alive over my daughter? Traitor, death is the only punishment for you. These events play over and over in her head as she evolves to the Bloody Baroness. A title the galaxy gave to her. A title the book points out is a mask, a character, a part to play as punishment for her existence, a hate for herself stated within her first chapter. Andy had decided long ago that the nightmares were her punishment. This theme doesn't just stop with Andy. Cortez lies about his honorable status as a leader, nor lies about her deformities to rally her people. Everything with Valen, just about every major character is hiding their true selves to play their part. But Andy is given the chance to break free. If she can save Valen, she will legally be free. But over the course of the mission, she realizes what she really wants is for those close to her to forgive her so that maybe she can forgive herself. Except that some things are just out of your control and find a way to love yourself and maybe love another. Can Andy be forgiven? And the book's answer is no. In the end, Valen stabs her and says she is beyond forgiveness. Vengeance will be his, barely escaping again, only to lose everything and everyone to Zenith. It's true, the book doesn't convey that well at times, but in more experienced hands, it could. Here, it's just subpar. So why was the book given so much hate? Chapter 7. It too, Booktube. So, Zenith wasn't meant to be like this. One day, Lindsay came to Sasha and asked her if she wanted to write a book together. Sasha has always had a passion to become a writer, and Lindsay wanted to do a fun project after her latest book got rejected. They announced Zenith and revealed their plan to serialize the book via ebook over the course of a year with the goal to publish. With luck, maybe with a big publisher. But the tone Sasha has throughout the early videos of Zenith indicate that may not fully happen. And here's the thing, while this is Sasha and Lindsay's book, going through their videos, I can't help but feel this was Sasha's baby with Lindsay being more of a mentor. This is speculation, but I couldn't shake the feeling that this whole project was mainly to help Sasha get her feet wet with becoming a writer. Whatever the reason, all that was thrown out the window when the first ebook was released in June 2016. Sasha's audience bought the book in droves, climbing all the ebook bestseller lists, but most importantly, the New York Times. All of a sudden, publishers were making calls and they chose Harley Quinn for, who knows, the best exposure, creative freedom, they like the editor. Either way, Zenith is kicked into high gear to full-fledged novel with a manuscript delivered in six weeks. All the while documenting their progress from signing the contract, revealing the cover, editing, meeting all the people involved, and all of this builds up a lot of hype. See, a booktuber getting their book published is like when a beauty guru gets a makeup palette. It's seen as a sign of legitimacy. But it's not like Sasha is the first. There are several smaller creators who've done it, whether self-published, indie, or the off-branch that is author to, but Sasha is seen as the big one. Because at this moment, just about every major voice in the community is either about to publish or is in the process of writing a book. And with a community that's very passionate about how they want to see their fiction, well, look out world, here come the booktubers, and we're going to light the world on fire. But when Zena came out less than studying, it got Julius caesar The whole thing from an outsider perspective is just uncomfortable. You have all these smaller creators dragging the book like it committed murder, while all the big creators either ignored or never talk about it fueling this animosity over the crime of a YouTuber writing a subpar book. I'm sorry, but I have to ask, when has a YouTuber ever written a good book? Better question, when has a YouTuber written a good fiction book? 
We all know that's the stereotype, that most YouTuber books are trash, which is why most are quick cash memoirs. Can you even name me 10 fiction books written by YouTubers that can be considered good? I really like to know, and no, you cannot use John Green. He was an established writer well before YouTube. He doesn't count. The correct answer is Hank Green, at least get that right. And even then, you can't compare them over one that was given a lot of time and prepped, and another that was rushed out in six weeks by a first time ever writing author. So I ask again, why was everyone so angry? Multiple factors. There were several people who expected someone who read a lot of YA to write good YA. No. Reviewing fiction and writing fiction are completely different skill sets that don't transfer over. It's a common misconception. Then there were a lot of people who got the book for the sense of community, even though many never actually watched Sasha's videos before. And then you have several who made videos saying they are aspiring writers too, which cuts to a major nerve. Mainly that the book only got published because of Sasha's popularity over any merit which upset small creators thinking they couldn't do the same, or at least sooner, if they only had over 100,000 subscribers. Wow, hindsight is 2020, because that's a recipe for disappointment. Yes, Zenith was picked up because of its popularity, but only because the community made it popular. Publishers are always looking for what sells, and a popular YouTuber's ebook goes right to number one on its debut. Why wouldn't they? I mean, are we going to forget that's how Fifty Shades happened? And no, I don't think this was a scam in any way. Everyone involved looked to just be into releasing a book while the coals were hot, and Sasha and Lindsay needed to write their story fast before interest died down which fed into this hype loop with a passionate community to buy in mass that made it successful. Sasha and Lindsay are New York Times best-selling writers now. But also remember, that book disappeared right afterwards because no one else cared about a niche YouTuber's book. And it wasn't even good, you guys! How can anyone see this coming? How dare they? Does that mean I won't be able to get my book published because I'm not popular? Look at all these problematic problems and nitpicks and guys, breathe. This book is not as bad, especially when you compare to works like Save the Pearl or Tiger's Curse or even the ending of the last FNAF book, which I know you're sick of me talking about it, but I'm making a point. You guys want to talk problematic garbage? Try reading Firefly where the author openly endorses pedophilia, who then cries in the afterword about censorship because no one wants to sell this book about pedophilia. Let me tell you, reading something like that completely warps your sense of bad, so things like Zenith are just... meh. Though, funny enough, the publisher of Firefly would later become an imprint of Harley Quinn. The universe has a weird sense of humor, and I love it. But there is another reason I'm doing this. Last summer, I did a bit where I pretended to burn someone's book to show my frustrations with how it wasn't explaining anything, thinking it's a fun visual gag. But when I look back on it, I was being a raging asshole. An indie author sent me a free copy of their first book and I pretend I'm going to burn it? Something I've never done in any other video? when there are plenty of more offensive works that deserve it? And for what? A joke? What was I thinking? Seriously, I'm sorry, Mark. I overreacted and in turn undercut my own points for silly. I could have done better, and that's what I feel about Zenith. I'm not saying Zenith shouldn't or doesn't deserve to be criticized, but the points did not equal the hate it got. It's been a year since Zenith has come out, and it's hard to look back and think most of this was good or productive in any way. And I lose all patience when I found people are review bombing the sequel Nexus on Goodreads even though no one has read it yet. Seriously, 
Goodreads, you are garbage. For uh, without your guys' support, without your guys, just like just amazingness, I would not be holding my book in my hands today. Sasha, Lindsay, I hope you are doing well. I have no idea if this situation affected you over the year, but I hope even with all the hyperbolic nasty, you were able to see the valid points people had and applied those for your next book. I may not find the book all that stunning, but I hope you continue to grow and create. You clearly already are, so I raging asshole, you will continue writing. As for the community, I understand what it means to get emotional over a book you were excited for. We cannot control how we will react when we interact with media, but Zenith did not deserve all this. It's not a good book, but compared to others, it is far from a blight on humanity. We need to beware that our words have power. And while it's fun to be mad for mad sakes, sometimes taking a step back can do us a lot of good to improve. And that applies to me just as much as it applies for you. Believe me, I'm not perfect in any sense. Have you seen my videos? Talk about a hot mess. Cause in the end of the day, a YouTuber wrote a subpar book. In other news, water is wet. <laughs>